spill there, so oh, yeah. there you go. Welcome to my you know. life. When Meryl and Stephen leave, <laughs> it's like I'm still waiting in baggage claim for my trunks to come down. <laughs> Happy to be here. Well, thanks for doing this, Tom. Thanks for sure. doing double duty uh, today. Appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, you're very kind. You're very kind. Thank you. And I just want to remind everybody that you can find video of the session tomorrow morning on uh, WashingtonPostLive.com. Oh. Okay. So there you go. You can watch it yourself, actually. So um, <laughs> Anne did a great job. So I want to thank Anne for the the interview she did. Yeah. We're so we're so lucky to have her and. She left me a few questions to ask. Uh, so uh, in preparation for this, uh, this role, I understand that you got Ben lessons from Sally Quinn. Is that right? I had, I had a, a, a long What is a Ben long lesson? Laundry. Well, uh, <laughs> you know, I had, I had already uh, looked at an awful lot of the material. And, and, and I mean, I had dinner at Ben and Sally's house back in the day through Nora Ephron and a few other people, one of those great kind of like salons where you kind of think, does everybody love each other or hate each other? <laughs> I've, been to, I've been to a few of those, so yeah. Not quite sure. Um, but it was, it was kind of like his, about his uh, joie de voix, if I'm, you know, his, his, his enthusiasm, his love of what he did, mm. uh, his, uh, his sense of what was uh, right and wrong. And um, what, was, what I loved was everything I've heard from people who knew and loved Ben uh, in, in great detail is, a, is all a reflection of, uh, of the same image. His uh, chatting with him on occasion was exactly like um, reading his, uh, his memoir, a, a Good Life. It was exactly like every piece of, uh, of uh, video that I've seen, every interview I've seen, good. he is this, the same genuine, interested man. Uh, he was, uh, uh, he, and in particular, uh, in regards to the, the Pentagon Papers, um, in that same Pointer Institute interview that uh, I talked about, he said, you know, you, you look at it now and you think, well, you know, what, what was the big deal, you know? It was, it was an old uh, document, it had been sitting around for, for five years, and then you think about it, why was that worthy of an assault on the First Amendment? and a threat to throw everybody in jail simply because it said what Dwight Eisenhower said in 1952. Um, and that, 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 that kind of long, long haul marathon-like perspective uh, was something that uh, I think he, I think it was part of his, his, uh, his credo of uh, how to put out a newspaper and how to tell the story and how to, how to get to the truth. How, how to be, uh, I, I don't know, how to be cynical without being a cynic. Mm -hmm. You know, how to understand that anybody in power, even if they're just the head dog catcher of, uh, you know, of Claremont, Montana, might tell you a lie in order to protect his job and his private parking place. Uh, and you just think, well, why would anybody in power lie? Oh, well, it's in order to maintain a status quo or to gain some sort of purchase. And knowing that they do that is one thing, but constantly expecting them, them to lie all the time is, is something else. And uh, I think uh, for that reason, he was, uh, he was a magnificent guy to uh, time and place and job and responsibility. And what, what do you think the lessons are for today, for, for journalists today from, from Ben? Uh, and I'm gonna tell you, not to get it wrong. Uh, this is another thing that he said. Uh, he says, uh, you have to have all the confidence in the world that that story you're putting on the front page is the truth. Because if it's not, he said, you have to eat it for 24 hours, <laughs> and it doesn't taste good. <laughs> uh, and that was back when, you know, uh, an incorrect story or an uh, inaccurate story would, would, you'd have, you know, 24 or 48 hours in order to clean it up. Now it has all sorts of repercussions that, that go around the world much, much faster. And I think that is, I think that was a paramount, if I was going to divine what was the what is the lesson to learn from then and now is number one you never stop but number two it's got to be right and you see examples of it if there's so much of a sliver a crack uh, in the authenticity of it there is a not only is there a certain price to pay but you give an opening to the liars to uh, to make hay of that yeah these repercussions are instant and then they last actually more than 24 hours these well, days yeah now they'll base policy on it you know or, right. Or, you know, continue on a guerrilla war against the fourth estate that will just go on and on and on and on, fueled by 
inaccuracies. Right. So, so how do you think uh, journalism is doing these days? What, what is your assessment? Uh, well, I think it's. I mean, this ass, movie is a, uh, this movie is about courage and journalism and great journalism. But what's your what's your thought on journalism today? How are we doing? Well, and you don't have to be kind just because you're here at the Washington Post. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, well. I am, I'm now to the point that I have removed all news alerts from my phone. Really? Uh, I don't, I'm not part of any email chain because I found that there was a ton. I mean, it was ringing, honestly, every three minutes from some source or another. I also got rid of solitaire, so I, I'm not playing so much of that. <laughs> um, um, because the, 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 the volume of it is, uh, is too ongoing, and I found myself reading looking at the headlines and yet, yet not reading in the stories just because there was so much. I think bona fide, good, true uh, reflection of the fourth estate as it uh, as is, is meant to be is, is, is fabulous now because it's more valuable than ever before. Um, the, uh, the war that is going, the guerrilla war I think that is going on in, in by obfuscating and denigrating you know, the aspect of, of, of what journalism and what a free press means is really meant to do one thing and one thing only. And that is to give somebody plausible deniability. If you keep saying it's fake, it's false, it's a lie, it's a lie, it's a lie. When the truth comes out, you have a pretty good record of saying that it's a lie, it's a lie, it's a lie. And at the same time, of course, there is the legitimacy of, of that, that brand of uh, outlet that is hell bent on putting out false news or innuendo, treating a, treating a uh, uh, fa fantasy or you know conspiracy as, as outright fact, and by that you d delude the playing field, which I think again makes the work of of uh, journalism as as defined by the great American tradition of it more valuable than ever before. There is a there is an adage that that uh, that just the truth will out at the end of the day. Uh, the, the nonsense disappears by the wayside and the truth remains. It's, you know, lies are made out of sticks and, and uh, gossip is made out of straw, but the truth is made out of brick. And it stands there for a long time. It stands the test of time. And you still believe that because uh, these days a lot of people are worried that uh, the public won't be able to distinguish between fact and fiction. Uh, they won't know what are the falsehoods and what, what is the truth. I am. Because they're breaking into sort of tribes. It's a very tribal environment. I am, a, I am a lay historian by, by choice. I read history for, uh, for enjoyment. And there has always been, this has always been, um, there has always been a Father Coughlin on the radio or a Colonel McCormick with a great metropolitan newspaper at his disposal. There has always been this. And yes, they hold sway. Um, they're, able to, they're able to steer um, uh, public issues for a while. But eventually they fall down they, because, they're, um, because it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a porous uh, enterprise. And it is based on an agenda. And eventually people catch up. The reality is, of course, is that the technology is, is letting all that happen on, at hyperspeed on steroids. Uh, but along with that, too, the truth can go around the world almost as fast as a lie. And a lie will disappear in time. And a truth will remain as constant as the speed of light. And so therefore, I'm, I, think, I think that people who have that same ethos uh, and have that same uh, sense of responsibility of let's get it right. Because if you get it right, all they, can do, all they can do is disagree with it. They can't argue with it. They can only tell you whether or not it's important or not. And time tells that. Great. Uh, in terms of the press, this is a movie. I about love lecturing a room full of journalists. Well, they're not a room full of journalists. They're not a room full of journalists. Uh, I'm going to let somebody uh, sit up there and tell me what acting is, and I'll <laughs> sit there and listen to everything that you have to say. I'm going to let you lecture us uh, more, actually, here, because I, I want to know whether you feel that the press is. I mean, this is a movie about challenging authority uh, and uh, the sort of the highest authority in in this country, the the presidency and the entire federal government. Are we, is the press doing that enough these days? Do you feel that um, it's challenging authority in the way that it ought to? Oh, yeah, I think it is. But uh, absolutely, uh, constantly, is whether or not it gains purchase, um, is, is, does, does it hold sway? I just saw uh, Katie Tour. Actually, I was on the Stephen Colbert show with Katie Tour, And what she went through on the, uh, on the, on the campaign trail of literally being vilified in, in the center of an arena with, you know, 8,000 uh, angry fans who felt a little bit like, uh, 
Uh, she was in a Roman Colosseum there for a little bit. So that, that exists because the volume of information that's out there and the volume of vitriol and opinion, let's just say opinion is out there, uh, and it's, it's so massive. But uh, I think that the, uh, well, you know, in the, in, I was, I was, I, I'm not a news junkie. I, I don't watch everything all the time, all the time. But even in the, even in the Alabama um, race and the coverage up to it, I saw much, much more coverage of Moore than I did see of Jones. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think I, I was ever saw a, a, a bit of Doug Jones's uh, uh, campaign stump speech, and yet we were seeing the same footage over and over of, of Roy Moore. And like the question I would have is, uh, why? Uh, why is that? Uh, why aren't we getting some of the message that's coming across from the other side? Um, but we're, it's, as far as uh, TV go well. He, here's here's a here's the one of the great difficulties I think because I know people that that work for the networks and it's if it's, I, and I, this is all just a euphemism. I'm just pulling this out of my head. If you find out that um, say Coca-Cola can kill you <laughs> over time, it could give you diabetes. It can make you uh, obese. It's mostly made out of sugar. It will rot your teeth. Huh. Where'd you get um, that idea? Um, mm. and, and if you want to do a three-minute story on how it's really, really terrible for you to drink, do you think it's going to appear on the CBS Evening News? It's not, because Coca-Cola pays mil billions of dollars in advertising revenue for football and for everything else. That dichotomy is in place, and I think we sort of know it, and maybe we accept it. But you have to read that type of story. And I'm not taking on Coca-Cola. because I have type 2 diabetes, so I can speak from experience. <laughs> um, uh, uh, you, you have to be able to find that, uh, that somewhere. And you might have to turn to you know, lesser organ, uh, uh, organs in order to find that out. Um, but as long as you can still find that out, you might be slightly ahead of the game. Uh, I don't know that print journalism has the same sort of difficult, but you know, you guys are owned, a lot of magazines and, and newspapers are owned by other greater conglomerates that might have a problem doing that. Mm -hmm. And this is just, you know, some aspect of the corporate hackery that goes on daily in daily life uh, uh, here in the United States of America. So we, uh, it, it's a, the amount of, hopefully there is, I think Merrill said it best, were you guys here for when Merrill spoke? Uh, <laughs> When she says we did, you know, it's two step forwards and, and, and one step back. Uh, and I think we, we can just keep our nose above water if we continue at that pace. So um, you get covered a lot. Uh, yeah, I do. And so what do you make of, uh, what do you make of coverage of yourself? I mean, I, I, people try to, obviously, they want to know more about you. I, you know, they would like to know more about your private life. You're very private. Uh, and I, I recall I read a quote about you, for example, that what I, said, "What did I say?" Uh, I'm going to tell you. Um, you said, "Quite frankly, I think I just never trusted the press to get it right." So, what did you mean by that? That well, um, <laughs> let me, Marty, let me open my heart to. <laughs> That's what we're here for. I remember a long time ago, um, a friend of mine. This is when actually when I was promoting Splash. I was a very young man, and I thought they had invented, had invented the press junket just for us <laughs> in our movie, because our movie was so special. And uh, a friend of mine said, hey, I got a, I got a, interview, I got a call from the, the, the reporter that's going to be entering me. And uh, she said, um, do you think Tom is more like the next Cary Grant or the next James Stewart? And the guy said, you know, I think he's the next Cary Grant. He's good looking enough, and you know, he can handle the repartee, and, uh, uh, I, and he, he's good with dialogue. I, I, I think he'd be the next Cary Grant. And the, the journalist said, but don't you think he's the next James Stewart? <laughs> <laughs> so there is, there is a sort of editorial decision that has been made before you said that, unless, of course, you say something so stupid that they, they <laughs> that haunts you for my f-bomb uh the uh, uh okay, that, that, will you, that will haunt you that will haunt you for the rest of the days but also part of it is also well you know is it is it really ridiculously important uh, uh i think i discovered and maybe got lectured long ago that what you do is you you don't lie you must not lie to the press i don't i don't think i've said outright lies but you also just tell them enough of the truth 
One of the jokes I always say in long interviews, which this does not rate as, Marty, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, is that uh, your, your job is to find out what makes me tick. Right. And my job is to make you think you have found out <laughs> what makes me tick, in which case I'm just like anybody you interview. So uh, I'm just trying to maintain my place on the food chain. <laughs> So I wanted to get back to, there was a discussion in the previous session about the, the role of women uh, in the film industry, uh, that sort of thing. Um, you know, what, um, how, do, how, do, how, do, how does the industry deal with that? How do you get uh, more women in, in prominent roles? How do you get women more as producers and women well, as, you know, as studio I, I'm, chiefs? I am, I am extremely lucky and for some reason I'm ahead of the curve because uh, I have had so many women bosses as I was coming up. Uh, Penny Marshall gave me my first, you know, you know, big kind of like uh, movie that, that landed, Nora Ephron. I've worked with uh, uh, Amy Pascal was my boss on like four movies over at Sony. Uh, 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 Stacy Snyder has been. I have worked with an awful lot of women in powers of authority. Uh, my luck, uh, because you know that they they got their jobs through a, a meritocracy, uh, regardless of their gender. In order for there to be a bona fide change, Merrill has talked about this. It requires the movement of women into positions of power and responsibility. Simple as that. When there is that type of closer parity literally in percentage of men versus women in decision-making processes, in the, in the green lighting and the creation and the writing and the designing uh, of, uh, of uh, directing and, uh, of, uh, of, of films, there will be a whole different sort of, there will be a different brand of, uh, of take. Uh, I think one of the most exciting things you could say about what happened is, I don't, I'm, forgive me, I don't know her name, but the woman who directed Wonder Woman mm -hmm. delivered something that it was assumed that women by and large, could had never really de uh, delivered before a big rock'em sock'em uh, 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 action tent pole movie that is going to uh, you know hold up for a, uh, a lot of other uh, uh, sequels. Now you know that's an important aspect of the commerce of of, of the industry, uh, and more of that is has to happen. I mean, there's no other way of give more women jobs uh, if you want to truly co and then and then obey or, or, or agree to, I think, a code of ethics that goes along with not just a code of behavior, but a code of ethics. This is, what's, what are your principles as far as, uh, as uh, uh, making movies go and, and putting out a product? I think in a lot of ways, television uh, does a much better job of motion pictures still. Than I, the women, women are writing, directing, producing, designing, and making decisions for uh, for television shows to a much, much greater number than motion pictures, simply because of the money structure and the economics is so expensive when it comes down to making money. But parity in the boardroom and in the, in the, uh, uh, in the, in the writer's room uh, uh, across the board, that will make uh, a huge difference. And uh, I loved what Merrill said earlier, there will be a backlash and there will be a backlash to the backlash and beyond that will come, will come some other uh, we'll, we'll, it will settle down, and I think they'll start cutting off the names of people's uh, at the top of the resume, so you don't know if it's a man or a woman. Right. It seems like you've been somewhat of an ally and a, a advocate for bigger women ro women's roles as well, and in, in mo movies that you've been involved in. You know, you were in, you produced Big Fat Greek Wedding and yeah. Mamma Mia. Yeah. Uh, also been a co-star where women have played large large roles. Yeah, and that's not an altru that's not an altruistic choice, quite frankly. I mean, that would just you know, that, that's the way it all worked out. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I should say, no, those were specific choices. <laughs> because I want a badge, damn it. I want a badge that says, good guy. <laughs> I want a good guy badge. Um, but it's, the, the, it, honestly, it does, it, does go, it does go back to the, the great good fortune and exposure I had early on. I, I can't, can't quite pay much attention to it. I will tell you this, I have never been more afraid of a boss uh, no man has scared me as much as Nora Ephron did when I was, right. uh, when I was working for her. And, and uh, by, I have never been more, more happy with myself at pleasing a boss when Nora Ephron told me that I'd done a good job. So. Is that why you dedicated the movie to her? Well, that was, that was uh, Stephen's choice. Uh, Nora, Nora, uh, Nora's connection to all of this is, is pretty, you know, pretty extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, because she was, the, she was the, a great journalist who, 
you know, one of these days someone's going to play Nora Ephron in a movie, and I hope they get it right. Uh, it, it'll, that'll be a hard thing to do. Good. On, uh, uh, there's been a, a bit of controversy about this movie. It's come from a um, uh, competitor of ours, the New York Times. Uh, yeah. Which has been kind of apoplectic uh, about the idea that this uh, movie about the Pentagon Papers is focused on the Washington Post when the New York Times uh, broke the Pentagon Papers case. Mm -hmm. What's your, what's your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, they uh, didn't have Catherine Graham, in all honesty. Um, we, uh, I, I, okay, all right. Um, if they'd had a Catherine Graham, it would be, I'd be, we'd be calling it the Times, and we'd be here, and you guys would be pissed off. So, um, at the moment, we have no complaints. We. So. Uh, <laughs> Actually, we read it. I, I saw an op-ed piece before we, just the day after the movie was announced, which yeah. was uh, uh, How Dare They right. uh, from the perspective of the New York Times. We give it all the, we give it all the credit and credence that it's due. Uh, we are playing catch up to the New York Times. They break it, the Neil Sheehan story. It's the main story point of what we're doing. And, and there is a type of movie to make about the New York Times getting it, but it's not going to be as interesting, interesting as the Post because of Catherine Graham. This, the, 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 our screenwriter, Liz Hanna, and then Josh Singer as well, captured the zeitgeist of this moment because it does take place at, in this critical week where she went from being the daughter or wife of the man who ran the paper and owned the paper to being the owner and runner of the paper. And she had to, she had to make the decision that could have easily cost her everything uh, and it had to be done very quickly because the presses needed to roll in another hour and 45 minutes. With her in there and all of the attendant, um, attention that it gets into the gender politics as well as the historical perspective of those great shots of uh, her not, not being listened to or her being the only woman in a, in a room full of, of suits, of, of <clears throat> being told what she had to do or she would be ruining her legacy in the, in the newspaper. That's what just kind of like jacks this movie out of being uh, uh, a, a, a story of how a story, um, a movie about how a particular story was broken. Those human details, I'm not saying the New York Times couldn't have had fascinating human details, but I don't think they're gonna top Catherine Graham becoming Catherine Graham. You could just call this movie Catherine and it would be, and it would be as accurate about what's going down uh, as, it, as if you called it the Pentagon Papers or the Post. And that's a, that's a screenplay actually I read in February. Uh, before it became much more detail-oriented that Stephen brought to it. And I thought, that's, that's, that's enough. That's enough right there. Um, so God bless him. I, I, it's funny, that I, I can't imagine they'd see this movie and still be as pissed off as they are. Mm -hmm. But they're a cranky bunch up there, aren't they? Uh... They are, they are, I can say that, for sure. <laughs> You know, actually, They've never so, cut me slack, so I'm not going to cut them any. What do you think of that? I, I'm, I'm with you there, uh, for sure. <laughs> I've actually talked to a lot of people there, and they've, they've, the, some of the people at the New York Times have suggested that uh, there ought to be a movie focused on about Watergate set in the newsroom of the New York Times. There you go. Uh, so you interested in let them take interested in let role them like take that? that on? Yeah, who would I play? I don't know. <laughs> um, in the previous session, uh, it certainly delved into the realm of uh, politics and political statements and uh, important public issues. Do you see that as something, uh, an important role for you uh, as an actor, that you should have a role in shaping public opinion? Um, I, I adhere to the Shakespearean uh, definition of what my responsibility is, and that is to hold the mirror up to nature. Um, I, I am very suspect of any film that is bent on altering uh, a consensus. I'm all in favor of films that are built on il uh, enlightening people to facts or ideas um, or uh, making, making things like uh, uh, acceptance so glamorous in a movie that everybody wants to try to do it themselves in their own lives. Uh, but uh, as soon as you start trying to alter the conscious, bend it to a, a particular kind of will. It's like, didn't Goebbels try to do that? Isn't that what, what, what he set out to do? It's not propaganda. I mean, there is propaganda. We see it all the time. And there's 
um, in regards to nonfiction stories, there's an awful lot of revisionist history that can go into it. And sometimes it's just to make the story a little bit cooler or to raise the stakes or make the jeopardy more, more palatable to or palpable to an audience as well. Um, but there is, a, there, is a, there is a danger there. I mean, I will say that every time I've played somebody who was alive, uh, Richard Phillips or uh, Charlie Wilson for Charlie Wilson's War, Jim Lovell, um, <clears throat> Sully, um, I've sat with him and I said, now look, <clears throat> I'm going to say things you never did. I'm going to go places you never were. I'm going to do things that never occurred. Outside of this, I'd like to be as authentic as possible. <laughs> So help me <laughs> reconcile the fact that I'm a fake you, and so that it can so, so that it can withstand some degree of 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 long-standing uh, uh, viewing. Look, these are all documents, whether they're good or bad. They go into they go into a file. I mean, Gone with the Wind is looked at in one way in order to be. A uh, reflection of what slavery was like in the United States, for good or for bad, that's true. Uh, this movie will go in uh, up onto a shelf, and someone is going to look at it and weigh it as far as um, its uh, its uh, 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 authenticity or not. And I think that if you're doing that about the past, that's incredibly important because I believe that is what Shakespeare told the the advice of the players: hold the mirror up to nature. Try not to make things up. Try to be true to the, to not only the details, but the behavior of, uh, of uh, the, the people involved. Because when you start, pay attention to the logic of it. This is, I'm a big guy on logic police on movies. I, I, beat, I beat the living daylight out of screenwriters, both as, a, as an actor, but also as a producer, and say, explain this to me. How did these people get to this position? You're making an assumption there on what is or what is not important. Don't monkey around with the motivations who were there in, any more than you'd monkey around with where North Dakota is on a map. We know where North Dakota is on a map. Don't put it somewhere else just because you want to you have a palm tree in North Dakota. That's a weird way of talking about it, but that's actually what it comes, comes down to. Uh, you don't always get, you know, like, like if you're running around the Louvre trying to figure out what Da Vinci wrote on the back of a painting, it's not exactly the same requirements, but uh, you, you uh, don't laugh, come on, <laughs> cut me some slack. You do, however, want to live in the same physical universe that everybody lives in, even if you're not living in the same, uh, uh, you know, sort of like... Uh, uh, rule of behavior. It's very hard to drive across Paris in 20 minutes, but you know, you can, you can fake that for a movie. Uh, but you, it, our responsibility, I think, at the end of the day is, is, uh, is really quite large, and it does go back to that brilliant thing, is uh, what an actor's job is, is to speak the speech, I pray you, trippingly on the tongue, uh, as I pronounce it to you, and to hold the mirror up to nature. That's, that's our job. To, uh, Spencer Tracy said, our job is to hit the marks and tell the truth. Um, when that is expected of you, it's a lot easier. It's a lot easier to uh, to give into. Right. Well, in this interview the the other day with uh, BuzzFeed, uh, I think Merrill uh, expressed some reservation about being uh, a little too political, being out there politically. Uh, she's been outspoken on a number of issues, and as as have you. Uh, do you have any reservations along those lines, or do you feel entirely... Well, the truth is, no, nothing you do goes uncommented, upon, oh, uncommented on. That's just the truth. It used to be, right. no good deed goes unpunished. Well, now, no good deed goes uncritic, <laughs> un right. uncriticized. Uh, but that's all right. Uh, the, the, there are types of people that are specifically out there, you know, pretty, uh, with a very kind of specific uh, political message or agenda, or I, I'm not quite in that realm. But I do choose the work I do. I want it to, uh, to accurately reflect uh, you know, sort of where we are as a society. One of, the, and one of the areas that I'm quite particular about is uh, the standard construct of a story often is antagonist-protagonist. That means there has to be a bad guy in every story. 
And my question is, why does there have to be a bad guy in every story? There is one in, in ours, but it's Dick Nixon, you know, that, that we, knew, <laughs> we knew what he was up to. There's no other, there, and there's some people say, and it's all kind of like reflective and accurate. Um, there, not, not to jump on the, the Hamilton bandwagon, but there's a, there's a magnificent scene in Hamilton in which it's a rap that's going on that Lin-Manuel Miranda wrote, in which Thomas Jefferson is a rival to Hamilton, and Jefferson speaks, and you agree with everything Jefferson just said. And then Hamilton speaks, contra contrary to what Jefferson said, and you can't help but agree with Hamilton says. And it goes back and forth and back and forth. It's not somebody trying to crush the dreams of somebody else. It's not that line that happens in an awful lot of movies where sooner or later someone says something like, well, before I kill you, Mr. Bond, perhaps you'd like a tour of my installation. Um, <laughs> Look, uh, notice, uh, ventilator shafts wide enough for a man to crawl through. Unfortunately, you will not have that opportunity, Mr. Bond. You don't, you don't get in that kind of thing, I'm growing tired of this game. I don't, I don't like, I'm not interested in those kind of stories, and I never have been. And so politically, if I'm putting out any sort of, uh, uh, any sort of uh, statement with uh, the choices, which is uh, probably the best way anybody can be, uh, you know, be a, a socially politically active is to, well, you, you, you got you got to weigh the difference between being evil and just being not correct or having somebody have a, a better idea than yours. Great. We're out of time. Thank Marty, you very much. Everybody's Appreciate talking it. about you now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for staying, everybody. Thank you. Nothing but empty seats.